Hi, my name is Pastor Rebecca, and welcome to First Assembly's Church at Home. I'm praying that today you will give God the time and the space to really connect with you today. The Bible says that blessed are those who hear the Word of God and obey it. Last week I started a new series. I simply called the Spiritual Life Series. And in the study, I want to look at those areas that really enable us to walk in ways that don't just please God, but also makes life enjoyable as we journey along with God, that empowers us as we walk with God. And last week, we began with the first of that, and that was unveiling the masterpiece or God's design for your life. And I didn't get through it, and I'll start with that today. And if you missed it last week, you can catch it on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page and, and see it there. But I talked about how we're crafted by God. We're crafted by God, and he does all things well. He's the designer. And today I move on to the next component of this first part, and that is to fully understand or to unveil this masterpiece. I think we need to cultivate that relationship with God. I think that needs to be developed and cultivated, and I want to talk about that this morning. You know, friendships don't just happen because we desire friendships. and They happen because I choose to make them to happen. I choose to become friends, and that takes my time, it takes my understanding, it takes my conversation, it takes my honesty, it even brings in conflict to have that friendship. This last week, Jill and I had the opportunity to travel to Vegas, and, and before he ever asked me the question, did you gamble, let me just clarify, no, I didn't. I never have. I've been to Vegas probably a dozen times in my life, and I've never put a penny in anything. I just don't. But we want some good friends, Jay and Kim. And I talk about Jay often. We've been friends since we're 13 years of age. 13 years old, we've been best of friends. We've traveled the world together. Our kids are friends, and our parents were friends, and our kids' kids are maybe friends. They don't know each other. But anyway, there's something that happens with a good friendship, but it isn't just simple. It doesn't just happen because we want to be lifelong friends. In the process of that journey, there have been many hard conversations. There have been at times conflicts. But the value of friendship is this. It's something we develop. It's something we build. It's something we foster. It's something we choose to have. And once we choose that, it's a wonderful blessing in life to have that type of a friend. The interesting thing for Jay and I, especially when we were overseas, and Jill and I would be gone for four years at a time. The moment Jay and I got together again, it's like there was no time elapsed between the last time we sat down together. It's like we're still just the best of friends. There's no reintroductions necessary because we were friends and we had developed that. There's another expression from back in the day. I don't know who originated this, but it goes like this. A gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. Very good statement. I think very, very true. James chapter 1, verse 12 reads this. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Blessed is a man, or blessed is a man, who perseveres under trial. Now, if you have a New King James Version, anyone have New King James Version among us today? Okay, couple, yeah. New King James Version would say the word instead of trial would be tempted. Tempted. And maybe other translations would say that too. They exchange the word for trial to tempted or temptation in the, in the translation. They would read more like this. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, here's the thing. In the Greek translation, you could either go trial or temptation in this passage. You could go either way in the Greek. So some translations will go with trial, some will go with temptation. But that being said, these two words are very different in their meaning. Which one's right? Which one is it that is referenced there? Temptation or is it trial? One is something that is, is offered to us, a temptation, and the other is something that happens to us, a trial. Now, we're all tempted, aren't we, at various times? We are. We're all tempted. Usually, you're never tempted in the strengths of your life. You're tempted in the weaknesses of your life. 
If you're really great at your concern of what you take into your body, you're not going to be tempted with a donut. You're not. You're going to walk right by it because you know the sugar in that donut is not going to do well with what your body wants to eat or needs to eat. Now, if you're struggling with, with a diet and you walk by that plate of donuts, then you're going to have temptation because your body craves what that plate is offering you. I like sweets. I like chocolate. I am tempted by chocolate constantly. I've had to apologize to Caitlin and Rebecca numerous times over the years. I'll tell you in honesty, there are, some, there are days in the office we're right about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm starting to tire that I go on a quest across this entire facility looking for morsels of chocolate. I have found all the stashes that Rebecca has hid. I have had to apologize to Kaylee because I go up into the candy shack up there and I eat her food. I could take a table with chair and fork and knife and devour chocolate because it's my temptation. Now, if I know that, I'm going to avoid it. If, if it's what I need to do, I will stay away. But that's my temptation. It's not a trial. It's not a trial. It's a temptation. And a trial is something that, that we encounter, something that comes upon us. We don't ask for trials. None of us pray, God, give me a trial today. That would be a silly prayer because trials come through life. We all face our trial. And a trial is that, that, that component that is a burden, that is a concern, that is a weight. And it's a different thing than a temptation. So one is offered and one happens. But both of them are beyond my control. I don't control either one of those two. But verse 13 kind of answers the question of which, which word it is in the context. Here's what James goes on to say in his writing. When tempted, no one should say they're tempted of God. And that's the difference. God doesn't tempt us. He tries us, but he doesn't tempt us. So in the context of James, in his teaching, it'd be in, in essence saying, while temptation is happening or during temptation, rather than God tempts you. Because God doesn't tempt us. A better understanding of what James is simply saying is that under or during that temptation. Biblically, we understand that God tries us, and we trust in him. And we see those trials develop and build faith in our life. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, when God spoke about the years through that desert for Israel, through the wilderness, he did it to test their hearts, to see if they would obey God. And those tests really are a time to develop within us character and trust in God or faith. David prayed in Psalm 62, or 26, verse 2, he prays, examine me, O Lord. Try me and test my mind and test my heart. Test my heart. Now, that's not a great prayer to pray if you really don't mean it. <laughs> don't pray that prayer. But David's saying, Lord, look at me. Examine me. Look at my heart. Try me. Test my mind and test my heart. So here's a full verse from James 1.12 again. Blessed is the man who perseveres under temptation. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Challenges and trials are opportunities for growth. It's what develops us into who we are. It helps develop within us this godly character we want to follow after him with. I want to have the life of Christ. I want to be like that Christ-like person, that Christian, Christ-like and that a lot of times comes through that development of my heart, my trust in God. When we lived overseas, our kids, Valor and Alex, went to a small uh, parochial school, a Christian school called Hinkson Academy. And Hinkson was the name of the founder of the, the small school. It was a campus crusade, if I'm not mistaken, foundation originally. And, 
And, uh, but that's where they went. It was a smaller school and primarily Christian kids and a lot of missionary kids. And, and our kids, Baranac, spent a lot of time around missionaries, missionary kids and other Christians and national church leaders and national church uh, kids. And in a lot of ways, their surroundings, by and large, were godly with Christian influence all around their lives. That's kind of where our life developed overseas. They had, in some ways, and I don't want to say a protected life uh, in that way, devoid of temptation or devoid of trial, but in many ways, they were very sheltered. We didn't have TV in our home in uh, Latvia because they didn't have American channels and they had uh, Russian channels that we didn't understand and it was really poor reception. And, and so we didn't have TV. We didn't have that element and we didn't have a lot of outside activities in school at all. And in fact, in Latvia, they were homeschooled. So we really had limited, limited outside influence of temptation for the kids. And I'm thankful that uh, they had all this godly influence around them and and I'll tell you what, I've always prayed, and I continue to pray, that God bring around our kids and now our grandkids godly influences. I pray for that. You and I can't be with our kids 24-7. We can't. Others will be. And so as a parent, I pray that God bring them godly influences, moral people, good guides, people with good ethics that will speak into their lives. And so... I'm thankful for that godly influence that was there. It's wonderful. And as young people are developing that framework of what's right and what's wrong, to have this good counsel and this good voice and this good encouragement and empowerment, I want that in their lives. And I'm constantly praying for that. But when we came stateside, every fifth year we came home for the year and visited supporting churches. And during that year, generally speaking, our kids went to a public school in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And they learned a lot during those times at home, and, and some of it was good, some of it wasn't so good. But we felt it was valuable for them to live their lives and understand their faith and learn to trust God in the middle of those trials that they would encounter. And, and mostly that's what they did. But I remember the first time. Alex came home from school one day, and, and uh, we were in conversation and in the conversation, in the middle of the conversation, Alex used this terrible swear word. Now, I know that stuns you, that my son would swear. Preacher's kids are perfect. And they never, ever swear. I swear that's the truth. But yes, Alex in our conversation, he used this terrible word, just talking in conversation and about his day. And, and Alex and I would visit often, and we'd sit and talk and do certain things together, and we would just have that conversation. And, and just sitting there in my house, he says that terrible word. It caught me totally off guard. We're in our conversation, you know, kind of in conversation, you're not locked eye to eye. You're kind of looking around and thinking of different things. And all of a sudden I hear that swear word, and it's like I have whiplash. What, what did you say? And I asked, I said, what did you say? He repeated the entire paragraph, <laughs> leaving nothing out, exact the same, and used the same word over again. <sighs> he had no feeling or no hesitation. In saying it, well, that just tells me he has no knowledge of even what it means. And I said, now, do you know what that word means? He said, well, no, but my friends at school are using it. So I want to fit in, so I'm using it too. <laughs> cool, isn't that, Dad? <laughs> no, it's not. We talked about it a little bit more, and I explained why that word was offensive, and we didn't use that type of language in our house, and and uh, I never heard him use it again. Now, I'm not saying he didn't. But I never heard him use it again. In just a small way, that was his trial. That was a trial for him. Now, I believe he succeeded in that. Now, sometimes maybe he failed or succeeded, but I think ultimately he succeeded in it and, and uh, was successful in that trial. And I know... There are other trials that he would go through, or we all go through. But for Alex, in most ways, he succeeded in those trials. And today he serves as a pastor in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, using good words as he preaches. 
But that's the case with God. That's the case. He wants us to grow in him. And to grow in God, I have to have some sort of trial at my doorstep. Otherwise, I have no reason to ever fully trust him. If everything in my life was perfect and never had a problem, where is my requirement for trust or faith in God? But the very fact I have a trial or a challenge should and can produce within me a stronger person in him. That's what, it's re that's what it does. And so I don't necessarily pray that God give me a bunch of trials this week, but I do pray, God, make me stronger in you. And that prayer, that prayer is going to usher in at times our trials. That prayer will bring you your trial. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Some of you probably know this by heart. Or at least as I start it, you'll know it by heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. Now, here's the trial test statement. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And here's the success, success statement. And he will make your paths straight. That's the success part. He will. He will make your paths straight. The trial and the success. It is the desire of God, his desire to bring us through the trial and at the other end of it have greater faith in him. Not to defeat us, not to have us defeated, but to have greater faith in him because we trusted in him during the trial and we see the hand of God. Now let me say it doesn't always turn out like we want. It doesn't always turn out like I think it should. But it turns out as God desires because in the process of that, God builds me. He builds my heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. This is Paul's. His second letter to the church at Corinth. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Now I stop right there before I even go on further. None of us like weakness in our life. We don't like to show weakness, do we? We don't like to show our vulnerabilities or our weaknesses. We walk into church or walk into a gathering of, of friends. We want to say, hey, everything is cool. How are you today? I'm great. How's your week? It's great. How are you feeling? I feel good. That's what we, we present. We put on this presentation of everything's always good, even when it's not always good. Because we don't like to show weakness. And among our, our family... We broaden our shoulders and, and stand and suck in our stomach, and it's getting harder and harder to do that every day. But we suck in our stomach and say, I'm okay, when in essence, sometimes I'm really not okay. Tell you what, next Saturday when we have the men's breakfast, one of the components I really like about it is we just be, get to be together and be honest. We're not trying to put on a... a a facade of what we're doing or who we are, we can just be relaxed as friends sitting together for breakfast and coffee and, and be honest. His power is perfected in our weakness. Now, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. How many have weakness in your life? Of course we do. We all do. But that's where God's power becomes perfected in our weaknesses. So most gladly, therefore, Paul goes on. I'd rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. That's a success statement. Therefore, I'm well content with weakness, with insults, with distress, with persecution, with difficulties for Christ's sake. Those are the, that's the trial statement. I have all these things I put up with. And then the success statement right behind it again. For when I am weak, then I am strong. But that strength isn't in me, it's in God. It's when God empowers me in the middle of that trial, and I'm struggling through that trial, and I'm saying, God, I need you. And God comes in with his encouragement, with his power, with his strength, and he walks with me. 
Romans chapter 5, and I love the book of Romans, verse 3 through 5. Verse 3 through 5. Another one of those trial and success statement verses. And they're all through the scripture, by the way. All through the scripture, you can find these verses that have both the trial or the challenge along with the success of it. Here's another one, Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only this, but we also exalt in tribulations, the trial part. This is the trial statement. We, we exalt in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings perseverance. We're going to push through this thing. We're not giving up. We're not abandoning the ship. We're pushing through. And perseverance, proving character. And proving character that creates that hope. Now those all are that success statement of what it does. That proven character, that success statement. And then we have hope. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we're crafted by God. We are this creation of God, created in his image, that God wants to draw in us strength through his trial or through temptation to that challenge. And it brings us to that next part, which is so vital, and that's the development of the relationship with God. Where we have this, this relationship we develop with God. When a new piece of art is generally sent, a fine piece of art, I should say, is sent to a museum to be displayed for the first time, on loan from a government or from another museum, Cairo Museum to London Museum, and it's on loan. A lot of times they have what they call an unveiling ceremony. An unveiling ceremony and dignitaries and, and uh, friends of the museum will be invited in for a few days for this important this important event. And they have this ribbon cutting ceremony. They also have these type of ceremonies, ribbon cutting ceremonies for new bridges or buildings or ships and things like that. Have you ever watched one of those? Those great ribbon cutting ceremonies and they have these massively large scissors. Have you ever watched that? It's like, how stupid is that? Have those big scissors. What good are they if you take them home? You can thank a gal named Kimberly Beth, and she's from the Hennepin County, um, uh, what would you call it, uh, Hennepin County, she's a voted elected official there, Minneapolis, and uh, she was given the task of organizing a great opening of a, some type of building, and she had a pair of scissors made that are really big that would actually cut. So you can thank her for that. She's the one that's. But usually they have a ribbon cutting ceremony because what they're doing is something special. What they're going to show is something, something unique or something beautiful. And so they want to have everyone's attention at it as they unveil this new art or this new building, this new bridge, this thing. For you and I, the master artwork is not an item, it's not a thing. It's who we are. It's us. And God is unveiling us to the world as his child, created in his image, gone through testing and trial and being found pure as gold. And the closer we are to him, the greater that masterpiece becomes the world around us something beautiful to look at deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 2 here's how moses records it for you are a holy people to the lord your god and the lord has chosen you chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth Holy people, and God has chosen you. It's how God sees us. He sees us as that masterpiece being unveiled so the world can see who we are in Jesus. When I stand before a mirror, what I see versus what God sees, 
are two different things. Two different things. A long time ago, <clears throat> I was watching, uh, there's a, I'm not, I haven't been on Facebook for a couple months, but there was a, um, uh, sometime last summer, there was this little storyline of, of a boy who was pretending to be Hulk Hogan or something like, maybe it's the Incredible Hulk. I think it's the Incredible Hulk. I'll go with the Incredible Hulk on this one. He's pretending to be the Incredible Hulk, or, yeah, Incredible Hulk. Green outfit, green T-shirt. And there are a bunch of kids bigger than him that were bullying him. And all of a sudden, behind him stood another really, really big guy dressed as the Incredible Hulk. And all the kids ran. They ran away because of that big guy. Now, the young guy, the little guy, thought it was because of him. He could just see his little countenance change, like, wow, look what I did. And I think that's a good image of us and God. When we stand in front of our dilemma, when we stand in front of our child, when we stand in front of our challenge, we stand there in the faith of God, but it's not through us. It is through the power of God Almighty in us. And that's where we have the victory. That's where we have the strength. It's not in us, but it is how God sees us. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy, beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Let me just stop here. I almost got two components to this verse. The first component is simply this. You are chosen and beloved by God. I mean, that right there sends goose pimp, goose, not pimples, goose bumps down your spine. Because God of the universe chose you. He chose me. He calls you holy. Now, how many of us today feel we're holy? And there's probably none of us that walk around saying, well, I just feel so holy. Even if you say that, you're not. Because you got pride. And that wiped away the holiness. But God looks at us. And he sees a Gilbert. He sees a Karen or an Ed. A Dennis. And he sees us as holy, not because of our goodness, but because of the goodness of God within us. Christ within you, the hope of glory. And he sees us as holy and beloved. Those are powerful statements. And right behind it, he gives us instruction. He said, as a result of that, <laughs> therefore, it would be my word, put on the heart of compassion. All this is drawing us to a closer relationship with God. To be more like Christ. Put on a heart of compassion. Put on a heart of compassion. Kindness. Humility. Gentleness. And patience. When you look through those five words, you kind of scratch your head and say, how many of them have I really been successful at this week? Or how many of them have maybe I violated this week or failed at or weakened at this week? Have I always been compassionate to those who have been around me? Have I shown that kindness? And have I been humble? And have I been gentle? Have I shown patience? Bearing with one another. Forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone. Why? Just as God forgave you, you also should do for others. Bearing with one another. And that word bearing is just carrying. Carrying a weight with another. And here we go back to a friendship, a relational friendship again. Friendship that isn't always on a fun level, sometimes on a very difficult level. 
Sometimes I carry my friend and sometimes my friend carries me. In a marriage, sometimes my spouse, Jill, carries me and sometimes I carry her. When at times she's hurt or hurts, I become her strength. And when I hurt, she becomes my strength. But that is the relationship. Paul says, or the Bible says it in a different way. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. When one hurts, we all hurt. When one cry, we all cry. We bear that as body of Christ, forgiving each other. And I think there's an addendum here I could add. Forgiving each other and then also accepting forgiveness as well. I, can't, I find it easier and help me if I'm wrong here, but I have, don't, don't correct me, please. But I find it easier to forgive someone than to receive forgiveness from someone. I just do. I want to move beyond it. I want to skip past it. It's all right. And it's no problem. And I move on. But sometimes we need to be recipients of forgiveness. When someone asks forgiveness, rather than say, oh, it was nothing. Yeah, it was. If I remembered, if they remembered, it was something. And just to say, oh, it's nothing. It meant nothing. Yes, it did mean something. The very reason someone apologizes means it meant something. And sometimes my pride wants me to put that block once again up and say, oh, it's nothing. I'm bigger than that. No, we have to give it. And we have to be willing to receive it. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should forgive others. So here's these first part, this first part of God's design that I wanted to really lay the groundwork for. Three real parts that God crafted us. He's the designer of who we are. In that design, he creates for us opportunity to develop our faith through trials and temptations, even going under those. And they build trust and faith. And through those relationships, as we lean into him, he leans into us, and we begin to walk closer and closer, almost like Enoch in the Old Testament. Very little said about Enoch. We don't know much about him. All the Bible references him at is he walked with God and was not because God took him. How'd you like that on your epitaph for your gravestone? Walked with God, and God took him. <laughs> it's like, that's it. End of story. No great movies on that one. But here's a guy who simply had a relationship with God. And that's what the scriptures record. He walked with God. And that's the goal. To build that relationship with God where we walk with him and he walks with us. I'm not sure about you. I just, I don't know how you would answer this question. But for me, for me, I want to say on a daily basis I walk with God. That's my desire. I don't think it's the reality. I think there are days when my, my journey wanders a little bit further away than God would want me to walk. My attitude, my response, my negative feelings, just, you know, life. But really it's in those precise moments, those trials, that God wants me to lean into him. The moment I do, he's already leaning into me. He's already leaning into me. Katie, will you come for piano? I want to pray this morning. I'll continue this next week in a different component of it. But I will stop today with these parts of this design of God. He created us. He develops character within us so that we have a relationship with us. And I'm going to pray for me you can pray for yourself as well. That God would continuously develop in me a character that's Christ-like. Character that's following after him. And that each day I will walk closer and closer to God. That's really my prayer. It's a simple prayer, but it's a powerful one. I'm going to have you stand with me, if you will. And I'm going to pray that God will just help us this week as we walk this journey 
with trials and temptations that are there that will keep in mind, I am a creation of God, created in his image. He's with me in the middle of a challenge or trial. He enables me, gives me strength in a temptation. And all through this process, his desire is just to bring me closer to him. Jesus, I pray right now that you'd help me. Help me just, one, come to that realization each day a little bit more. I'm just not a person on this planet. But rather, I am a designed plan of God that you have created made me in your image for such a time as this help me realize that more and more and father as I go through my week and I find myself at times struggling with a trial or going through a challenge whether it's small or great that I lean into you I trust you in the middle of that trial. And that in that trial, God, you will sustain, you will enable, you will empower. And through those, I will find myself developing more of that godly relationship that I desire to be closer to you and allow you to be closer to me. God, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. You know, it's really easy for us to connect together. All you have to do is follow us on our Facebook page. You can follow the links below to give online, or you can stop by the office. Come and see us. We have this special gift for you, the Word of God for today. It's an easy daily devotional that will help you uh, to connect with God in a really awesome way. So have a great day, and we hope to see you back soon. Bye-bye.